No. Thanks no, for no. coming in. Certainly. And uh, Devin Burris is here with me, and we're going to um, talk about his life in aviation. So how about starting off uh, where you grew up, Devin? Uh, well, I've actually lived in the same house my whole life in Cincinnati, Ohio. It was previously owned by my grandparents. Uh, so we've got a big background in uh, specifically Blue Ash, Ohio, which is a small uh, suburb within Cincinnati. Um, lived in that, the same room in that house for my entire life, pretty much. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to talk about the flying background there, but... Yeah, let's, uh, let's do that. Tell, yeah. tell me how that all started. So, ironically, I started flying where John Paul Riddle and T. Higbee Embry met, which is, you know, the founders of the Embry-Riddle Company, which then became the university. Um, and they met at Blue Ash Airport, which had a different name at the time. And then they started their company down at Lunkin Airport. Um, and I've flown there, too. So I didn't realize this until I came down here and then found out about the history of them in Cincinnati. Nope. Um, but yeah, I started flying at Blue Ash Airport, got my private pilot certificate there, uh, flying a Diamond Katana. Um, and I really enjoyed that. It was a really small, podunk little airport. Um, it actually got shut down just a few days after I left. Um, I think I, I got my certificate on August 15th, and it closed August 19th for operations. Really? So, what was the reason for that? Um, pretty much the city, it was owned by the city of Cincinnati, but it was landlocked by Blue Ash's property. So Cincinnati owned the property within it. Blue Ash kind of wanted to finish off the rest of that area and wanted to own the rest of that property and build a park on part of it. And the original deal was to move the taxiway to a parallel taxiway and then use the, the remaining space that was kind of ineffectively used to make it a park so that you had a runway and then a park right next to it, which would have been cool. Um, but then the city of Cincinnati didn't hold up their end of the bargain, so they kept the runway. They still own it to today. Um, but since they didn't hold up their end of the bargain, the airport had to shut down because they didn't renovate. Um, but there is a nice park now that's being constructed there now. Um, just wish the airport had been renovated and maintained there. But it had to shut down because the city of Cincinnati didn't want to invest the money in it anymore. I started flying at 15, but I didn't do a whole lot because um, I was a reckless kid and got injured a lot. Um, playing volleyball and oh. ultimate frisbee and all sorts of things. Um, but then after I graduated from high school, immediately after that, I really kicked it into gear because I knew I wanted to get my uh, private done before I came to Riddle because I knew the enormous cost of a private pilot certificate here. Um, whereas I finished with 42 and a half hours at home where it would be more like 80 if I did it here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I wanted to get that done to get that cost plus to help me get ahead of the game so I could transfer those credits in. Um, so I finished it up the day before I came down to Riddle um, at Blue Ash Airport. Yeah. Did it all part 61, cool. but certainly not equivalent training to what I would have gotten here in Riddle. But so I had a steep learning curve once I arrived here to try to catch up. So the day after I finished my private, we packed up the car and headed down here. Um, made the drive down and moved on to campus and everything. Went through orientation, um, and then immediately went into my instrument training here, which is where I had to really catch up because I didn't know how to fly in class Charlie airspace and all the craziness of. Oh, well, I have to get a clearance. What? I can't just. Taxi out, you know. Um, yeah, so going from a all you know class golf airport operations now to <laughs> class Charlie was a it was rough at first, but you know it, that's I saved money there, and I could see why I saved money. But at the same time, you know, as long as I could catch up during instrument training by the end of my by my check ride, it was okay. It was okay, and you obviously did that. Yeah. Uh, sticking with that right now, if you had a high school student that was um, had intentions like you did that the, he wanted to go to Aviation University and um, how, would, how would you uh, advise him to do the same route you did, get his private out of the way? Yeah, I think it's important to not only just to save money but just to get an idea of the non-Riddle or UND or um, Prescott Riddle or whatever the environment is there because it's very structured and you kind of have a lot of protections. I guess it's kind of like flying an Airbus, if you want to think of it that way. Um, you have a lot of protections in terms of stopping you to, from going into a dangerous environment a lot of times. You know, like we have a flight supervisor here who's going to govern when you can leave, when you can um, depart, or when you can come back. Um, and you never run into maintenance problems hardly ever because you have such a quality maintenance program and a discrepancy-free aircraft all the time. 
Whereas at my home airport, it was like as long as the aircraft could still fly and was legal, I mean, you might as well go. Um, and then, you know, at times I would get the sign off from my instructor for a cross country and then, you know, it's kind of up to me whether I go or not. Um, granted, you would typically be around, but, you know, it's a lot more up to your decision. Do you want to go? Uh, I mean, the plane's out there. You're on the schedule for it. Um, you decide what it, whether you want to go. So I'm going on these solo cross countries pretty much, you know, making the weather decision a lot by myself. Sure. Um, whereas you have a lot more protections here that are going to stop you if it's really not safe. Um, so it's a lot more different environment flying with, you know, Part 61. Do you, do you know what the minimum is is to go that route, private instrument, commercial, and 141, what the hour limit? Oh, it's dependent on what the school gets approved by the FAA. Um, but here, I mean, you're looking at probably 80 hours for private here at Riddle, um, somewhere around 30 hours of actual flying for an instrument rating. A lot, a lot is done in the sim. You'll probably do if... Uh -huh. Double, or you'll probably do just as much, if not more, in the sim that you do in the airplane. Okay. Um, and then commercials, another 30 to 40 hours probably in the airplane. Um, so you're not looking at that many flight hours, probably That's 150 true. or so, to almost 200. Yeah, right around that area. Describe for me what risk assessment matrix is. So risk. Uh, well, that's what it's recommended that everyone use. Um, at one point, I believe it was required, uh, but it's either an online form or a paper copy of the matrix. But it's just you know all the different factors that go into a flight, um, and that's assigned a risk point value, and then it totals up to a risk assessment score, and then you can compare that to the matrix and see you know how high the risk is based on the number of hours. The, it's, you know if you have an instructor on board, the VFR IMC conditions. Uh, wind conditions, you know, is it a cross country, is it a local flight, those sorts of factors. And, and when do you use that? Um, ideally for every flight it comes with when we do our weight and balance it's supposed to be completed with that. Yeah. Um, but some instructors push it more than others but ideally everyone should be doing it. Yeah. How do you use it? Um, the, we have an, so when you get into the weight and balance we, we do our electronic weight and balance um, except for check rides you have to do it by paper. but. Uh, in there, it also has a link to the risk assessment tool, which is basically asking you all those questions to produce a uh, risk assessment score. Well, just tell me everything about NIFA quickly, I guess. Okay. Um, Let's go ahead. Okay. You're on. NIFA is essentially uh, the, it's kind of like the NCA or NAIA, but for flying. Um, so it's competition between collegiate uh, teams, uh, all in flight events and ground events, um, all related to aviation though. So it's kind of like I, I correlate it to a track meet of sorts. So we have a group of team, uh, co competition team that each has a variety of events that they compete in. We have a certain number that we can um, send to compete in each event. Um, and then within those events they score points for the team total, either in flight events or ground events. And then overall, there is an overall champion based on the total points accumulated by all the team members for their team. Um, and there's also a flight events champion and a ground events champion. Um, and there's a wide variety of events, all from landings to navigation, um, flight planning type stuff, uh, manual flight computer type competitions. Um, there's aircraft recognition, um, CRM. All, uh, a couple of different sim events, um, even message drop, which is a real fun event. Um, so there's all sorts of different events to participate in, um, to score points for the team. And uh, it's really fun. It's like usually a week long for the competitions. You start at the regional level. Um, if you qualify within the top three, you qualify for nationals, um, which is you know usually a conglomerate of about 30 schools uh, from around the nation coming together to compete. Uh, tell me about your internship. Uh, well, this past summer, I uh, went out to Las Vegas to work for a Legionnaire. Um, most people, I think, know about them at the moment, uh, mainly probably because of their uh, <laughs> first ones to charge for bag, carry-on baggage, uh, but that actually was their biggest publicity boost. Uh, but, yeah, so I worked for them out there in the flight operations and a little bit of safety uh, internship out there, worked in their headquarters. Um, and 
mainly I worked with pilot training, um, not so much daily operations, but mostly the training environment, um, creating forms for their new flight operations training manual. Got some good exposure to also some of the daily operations through the chief pilot in his meetings that he has uh, with the rest of the base chief pilots. Um, in addition, I got to participate a lot in uh, interviews for pilots, which is probably the greatest insight I got um, into seeing what the airlines are transitioning to in terms of interview, getting away from the technical um, and getting more into the personality-based um, soft skills and also um, just make sure you have basic stick and runner skills. That's all they're really looking for. They can train you up to their procedures and the knowledge you need if, if there's anything extra that needs to be added to your knowledge base. Um, and also got to see kind of what it's like to, you know, sit in an interview because you can have a 20,000 hour pilot that's been flying seven fours across the pond for years and now you ask him to do a uh, hold entry manually and he's sweating like crazy, shaking because he can't figure out this hold entry yet he's, you know, got 20,000 flight hours. It's all based on what you've been doing mainly, you know, what sure. are you used to. Um, so it's interesting to see how that could play out <laughs> pretty uniquely in the sim when you would when that would happen, because um, they gave me the unique opportunity to sit in the right seat and act as their um, co-pilot seat uh, sit seat support for them. No kidding. Yeah, because they didn't. You know, a lot of them didn't have seven five time. Pretty much, I think there was only one guy we interviewed that had flown a seven five before. Um, so they need the help in terms of the profiles to fly and uh -huh. um, set up for the approach and everything. So, but. Y it simulated the crew environment to see how they acted in a crew environment um, to make sure they had basic communication skills also. Sure, sure. Uh, Legion has uh, five sevens? They do have six 757s, yeah. Six 757s. And uh, they've got, they're, they're moving towards the A320, uh, but they're not getting rid of any other MD-80s because they own all of them at the moment. How many of those do they have? Oh, a lot of MD-80s. Okay. Um, I think it's on the order of like 50 or so. Oh, really? Yeah. They don't fly them often, and that's why they're not, they only have about 400 pilots. They have a lot of, they have a very low pilot to airplane ratio. I guess. Because they fly so infrequently. Um, be, but they don't need to fly because they're not leased, so they own them. So it doesn't cost them anything right. to uh, not fly them. Um, while you were there, you picked up your CFI. Yeah. Was that a pre-planned uh, thing? Or? It was a little bit pre-planned. I knew I wanted to do my CFI that summer. I didn't know I'd do it in Las Vegas, and I wasn't sure if I was going to do it through Riddle or not because of the enormous cost. Um, so I ended up doing it out there at a little Part 61 school at Henderson Executive Airport, which is a nice little airport situated in the Las Vegas Valley. Um, Cactus Aviation. Cactus Aviation was the name of the school. Perfect. <laughs> um, and did a Cessna 172 RG, so pretty much handled just like the Skyhawk, so it wasn't a huge transition in terms of flying, just getting into the right seat and learning that aspect um, and a little bit of systems change with the gear. Um, but other than that, yeah, it was pretty easy out there. Uh, obviously, CFI check ride is pretty intense, but, you know, it worked out pretty well for me. Uh, as long as you do a lot of your own self-study and can push yourself, it works out just fine if you do a Part 61. So this, this undoubted, well, no, you would have had one for your private. Uh, this was your sec, oh, no, not necessarily for your private. Actually, this was the yeah. only FAA check ride that you ever had. Uh, I mean, I did my private with a DPE. Oh. Um, and then I did my commercial because we don't have checking privileges because of the reduced number of hours. Uh, for commercial, so I had to do a, a DE ride there. So was uh, that a designated? Yeah. DE is designated? Designated examiner, yeah. So your CFI ride was with an actual FAA Gable personnel? Well, Las Vegas Fizz does have some issues right now. They don't really have a lot. They claim that they don't have enough staff members at least. Um, so we put in for an inspector ride, which is what's required. You have to ask them sure. and then they okay. tell you. Um, so I put in for the inspector ride about a month later, a month and a half, took him a while. He got back to me and told me, oh, we can't. Um, so here's the DE that you're assigned. So they assign a DE, okay. so you don't get your choice, gotcha. which is kind of their way to make sure they don't get any, you know, they can control their yeah. CFI check rides more. Exactly. Um, 
save. We, we did that, right? Everything in Legion. Yeah, I mean, I did my started my double eye out there also. Oh. Um, got that knocked out pretty much. Also, I ended up doing the check ride here, um, but got the sign off out in Las Vegas. <laughs> that was pretty interesting. You, the, you know, the D is looking at it like, wait, you got this sign off like a, a month ago out in Las? What? <laughs> and I was doing my check ride here in Daytona. <laughs> okay. But I was familiar. I did my instrument rating here, so I was actually more familiar with the approaches here. And it's a whole lot easier when you don't have mountains to worry about. I mean, the initial an altitude for the approaches out there was 8,000 feet. So you do one approach down to 2,000 feet, you're, okay, let me climb for another 20 minutes back to altitude before I can start the next approach. So it's a lot easier to do instrument work here. So the initial was at 8,000, what? Um, 8,000 some, yeah. Is that right? Because uh, the field's like 2,300, what's it? Yeah, it's about 2,300. 2,300. I don't know how I could remember that. You could start at some of the lower altitudes, but if you were going to do the full GPS approach, it was 8,000 up there. Oh, I see. Okay. And tons so of stuff. Like, tons of step downs. <laughs> I would think, yeah. Were you out over the lake for any of that? No, none of them came in. At least none of the ones that we could do because of the proximity of those airports to McCarran. Oh, uh, right. A lot of times they won't allow. Oh, right. They won't authorize any of those approaches because they cross McCarran's final approaches. Real quick, describe uh, the flow-through program or the sign-on for JetBlue and Cape, Cape Air and how that works. Uh, so in, they recruit you ideally as a sophomore in your university program. Um, they have a few select schools, uh, which is growing, uh, and I know UND is a part of it, and uh, there's quite a few schools down here in Florida that are, have joined on. Um, and once you're approved school, then they'll select you ideally during the sophomore year, like I was saying. And then once you graduate or if you start during your degree program, you can start teaching. They want to see at least one year of uh, teaching for the school or any of the schools within the program. So you can move to a different university if you wanted to, if you didn't feel like working at the university you graduated from. Um, or if it was closer to home or whatever the reason was. But as long as you teach at one of the partner schools, and then after a year, they'll take you on at Cape Air uh, to be a first officer there at Cape Air until you meet the requirements for an ATP. Um, and they need the full ATP at Cape Air because they're only using single pilot operations part 135. Full, full means 23 Not the restricted. Years. Yeah, you've got to be 23 years of age and 1,500 hours. 1,500, right. So you need the full ATP, uh, but you can start off as a first officer there, build your hours, get some multi-time underneath your belt, um, and get that very... You know, that's a tough flying if you don't have any autopilot sometimes and maybe no GPS. Um, probably most of them have GPS, but, you know, in the weather, down low, um, quick flights, you know, quick turnarounds, those sorts of things. Um, and then after about three years there or so, three, four years, depending on how um, many hours you have probably in the need of JetBlue, they guarantee you an interview um, with JetBlue. It's not, certainly not a guaranteed job, um, but... Um, Many, if not all, the people that have reached that point so far have been hired by JetBlue as first officers. Yeah. Um, but it is a pretty new program, like a lot of the flow-through programs that they that have started up recently. Um, they're all pretty new, so I haven't seen too many people go all the way through the program yet. But there's definitely some people that have, and it's been working well. And a lot of airlines have mimicked it, I gotta say, because I think they're realizing their need for a pipeline predictable flow of pilots. That's good. Pipeline predictable flow. PPF. <laughs> this kid's got it all. <laughs> um, so what time do you have? You got to go? You got to go. It's one o'clock. Right? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much. Not a problem.